Hey, welcome back. It's still uh, the breakfast on uh, Plus TV Africa, and uh, we're going to be looking at the papers right now. What is happening uh, in our country and beyond? What are the topics that we need to talk about? What are the things that really prick our interest today in the papers? Let's begin with The Guardian. Uh, yeah, we can see uh, 40 days to go. Uh, FEC approves over 100 billion Naira contracts. Yes, indeed. And more from the paper. Uh, athletes, officials panic as National Stadium goes. Uh, National Stadium Lagos floodlights collapses. Um, that was because uh, in the aftermath of the rain, mm. you know, that fell yesterday. I don't know if the rain actually directly caused it, but it's sad. 20 years on, family relieves memories of Adeife. Akinola Akindeko, uh, excess crude account um, to down to 474,754 dollars. Says fact. That's a paltry sum mm. <laughs> um, in this age of um, increased oil demand or prices, rather. A uh, crack widens in APC over alleged uh, misuse of 30 billion naira. Zoning concerns. A total shell to end gas flaring. As stakeholders decry industry loopholes yeah. those are some stories on the front page of uh, the guardian let's go to the next paper okay we have newspaper. we have the punch yeah insecurity local rice price jumps by 200 percent uh, local rice jumps by 200 percent and um, we also hear that rice price uh, scares or soars from 173 naira per kilogram to 521 naira per kilogram under Buhari, despite government's inter intervention. That's a report from the uh, National Bureau of Statistics, the NBS. And rice farmers, producers, experts blame rising inflation, insecurity, others for rice woes. We also have this report here that a Lagos mob burns a BRT bus as driver dies in the crash. And Elrofi raises the alarm over insecurity ahead May 29. Ogun father chains and starves two children to death. His own children, two to death. Substandard materials, quarks caused Banana Island building collapse. That's the report that is coming in from the experts. All right, that's uh, what we have on the punch. Let's go to the next paper, Daily Trust, with the following headlines. Uh, high fertilizer prices threaten wet season farming. Uh, really um, very important uh, story that the paper is focusing on. Death toll hits 151 as Lassa fever spreads in 26 states. Uh, Lassa fever seems to be a constant. Mm. Um, it always you know, gets attention and coverage. I thought it had gone. It's still around. Um, 3,298 inmates on death row, correctional service. Buhari returns from Saudi Arabia as Sudan crisis forces uh, flight rerouting. Oh, wow. That's a very, very good one because those guys are not playing at all. They will <laughs> take each other out. 40 days to go. Buhari's government approves 1.53 trillion naira for 11 road projects. <laughs> this paper, anyway, this paper puts its, its headlines. Banditry, 308 killed, 746 kidnapped in Kaduna in three months, report. And Tilu asks police to probe Adamawa election controversy. Mm. Interesting. The final paper. Okay, uh, well, we'll take maybe the Independent. Yes. Uh, the Independent has this story saying that Malami uh, Ahmed a frustrating $2.4 billion oil revenue probe. Uh, that's from the House of Reps. Uh, they may issue arrest warrant to cause their appearance. And that's what they're threatening. And they also have the story, less than 40 days to go, uh, fake OKs, billions of Naira road contracts. Um, there is a story saying why Buhari didn't intervene in a Damawa Guba poll controversy. A Nigerian army deploys troops in Guinea Bissau. Election petition tribunal grants Jandor prayers to serve Songolu GRV via substituted service. Tinubu asks police to investigate a Damawa Guba poll saga. And then federal government declares Friday and Monday public holidays. <laughs> the things are just <laughs> making me laugh. Let's begin to bring in our guest this morning, architect, uh, politician, 
um, father, husband is many things. Um, Ezekiel and Yaito, good morning to you. Thank you very much for joining us today, sir. Good morning. Really nice to be with um, you guys. Yes, yes. Um, I think uh, we need to give you an award for your fashion sense. <laughs> yes, indeed. We have to craft an award. Um, the breakfast award. Yeah, we'll just do something. All right, so um, architect, let's, let's start with um, this one from the Daily Impenny because I would like us to look at uh, what the legacy of the likes of Malami and um, the likes of uh, the finance minister uh, will be when this administration leaves? Because these two always seem to be linked with controversy. And uh, I'm sure you have noticed by now, I like to focus especially on our finance minister. Malami Ahmed, frustrating 2.4 billion Naira oil uh, revenue probe is uh, what the House of Representatives are saying. It's gone to the point where they may have to issue arrest warrants to cause their, their appearance. What exactly are they hiding from? You, you know, we, we run a country where we really don't understand what governance is. And we have not learned to draw a line between politics and governance. As a matter of fact, we run a country where what is politics is a race for state capture. So that when you get in there, it is this primitive accumulation of wealth that is what drives you, and not to give the best returns to the people by way of proper and prudent management of the resources on the behalf of the people. Once you understand that, the mindset, then you can draw a parallel between a dog and a cat. A dog is primed to bark, and a cat is primed to meow. When you bring a dog and you are irritated that he makes too much noise, the problem is not the dog, the problem is you. Or you go and get a cat and you say, you're, 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 not, you're not scaring the people. A cat is not expected to scare the people. The people that we bring into office, look at what has just happened in Adamawa State. They are not people who are coming to manage, to, to serve the people. They are people with complete ulterior motive, which is state capture. And if that is what they're coming for, then you should expect that what they will be doing at all times should be like how they can get money, how they can get money, how they can get money. How you now get angry that they are getting money instead of serving the people. The problem is not with them. The problem is with you who collected money from them to put them in office. Please give them the latitude to enjoy what they paid you for. We've just finished the election. Now, what's the parallel here? How do you tell me that you paid as much as $200 million to consultants or whistleblowers. Brother, if you are expecting anybody to come clean on that, then it's as good as telling me that uh, maybe Third Mine Line Bridge is up for sale. Because it's not going to happen. How are you going to explain that? What sort of consultancy? $200 million. Not going to happen. They're not going to tell you. And they also know that you yourself in the legislature, how serious are you? What do you really want? If we call you and say, bro, so relax, you know, you have some 40 days to go. Um, what do we do about this money and bury this case? I pray they never, ever try that because that case is not going to be buried. Let this administration go. The documents remain. The next administration, this case will come up because they are going to have major issues with funding and finance that they are going to look into past records and see to what extent they can recover as much as been looted. If not that, they will also want to have their own share of the, you know, no, 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 bite at the pie. So really, that matter, let me ask you a question. No, not really ask a question. You know, this thing came up about um, two years ago, if my memory serves me right. The whistleblower, this issue came up about 2010, um, 2020, I think. Why is it that 40 days to the end of the administration, it becomes so important for you to bring up that matter. 
I don't know if you guys can resolve that riddle for me because I can't, I can't seem to get it. Oh. Many of them are not coming back. Are they now trying to summon those people to come and harass them enough to have a share of the pie or... Or what? I really don't know. If maybe you guys can help me out at that at, at your end. Well, well, I think I think your question says uh, says uh, some things about <laughs> your question is answers itself. <laughs> you know, uh, but, but it's 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 amazing. And I, as you can before Yango comes in, I'd like you to talk about the the apparent um, the apathy of Nigerians towards the performance there. The um, the uh, 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 the actions and scandals involving some of the government officials. Because I mean, uh, in some some other climes, sorry to say, that that by now, in fact, way before now, people have been calling for the head of this finance minister. I mean, look at Kemi Adeoshun, who was um, asked to leave because uh, 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 she had some some issues with her uh, NYC. Anyway, Sir, there is no anyway. there is no comparison in terms of performance in terms of um, delivery, in terms of, of every standard that you should measure a finance minister by. There is no comparison. And it's, 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 it's scandal after scandal. And I keep saying it on this program. So maybe somebody needs to do a, 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 a compendium of all the scandals involving Zena Ahmed on her own, Aboka Malami on his own, and then both of them together. It even got to a point where in the fact the likes of Timmy Press Silva, the likes of Boss Mustafa, had to oppose certain payments they wanted to make all right, to a company, a huge amount of money. So it's always money, 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 payment, payment, let payment. Me, let me, brother, brother, let me tell you something. For you to remain in a system, it either, it must be that you are contributing to the system. For you to remain in this current system, it must be that you are servicing the system. There are one, two, three ways you service the system. One is that the public says, oh, this guy is so competent, this guy is doing so well, this guy is, you know, they, they hail him. Once in a while, you have people in an office, I don't want to call any names, who just come up and they're like, they're really good. The second is that you probably have certain political values that you bring to the system, and they know that losing you is not in their best interest. The third is that you are the oil or that, 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 you know, the, the, that lubricates the wheel of progress, okay? In which case, you are the financial drain pipe or the financial you know, uh, inflow pipe for them. Now, when we look at finance and Malami, we ask ourselves, where do they belong? Are they bringing in such great values to the system such that the system cannot they say, ah, oh boy, now this won't be our shining light oh, since the public seem to like them. I don't think that is the case. Now, look at the controversies surrounding the two of them. You realize that to a great extent, to the best of my knowledge, if my knowledge memory serves me right, a lot of them have to do with money finance. Another one has to do like with, uh, on the legal side, being able to, to, to create a safe haven on the financial, not financial, on the legal means to sustain the system. So these two people seem to be people that they, when, they, when they say jump, they say how high, okay? Because the finance minister herself, I think she is very unfortunate. The reason is that we had Madame Okonjo Iweala, global citizen, global bestseller, global reference point. And when she left, we were like, who will be able to like um, match that? Adiosu came and, in all fairness, surprised me because I honestly didn't give her a chance. I was like, mm -hmm, okay, just watch and see. But she pleasantly surprised me. She kind of stepped up to the plate and she really, really impressed a lot of people. And she must have been taking decisions that were antithetical to the wishes, the whims, and the caprices of the system. As a result, they look for Wayek. NYC. K. Yeah, NYC, sorry. NYC. And they kicked her out. And who did they replace her with? The jury is out there. <laughs> so you're saying in, in, a, in a matter of, um, of weeks, this thing might die. Matter of, of, of days. It might just uh, die a natural you know, death. You know, these guys are on their way out. 
And, you know, I find certain things really curious. And I really want Nigerians to wake up to what I want to say. We need to manage our expectation as at today because there are certain signs that I'm finding very uncomfortable. I'm talking of APC on APC, not opposition now. APC on APC. There are certain things that are quite unsettling to me as an individual. I'm sitting down, I'm trying to really find out what is going on, starting from, not even starting from way before, there was something that would make the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, somebody who is not a little child, somebody who's been a head of state before, somebody who's contested three or four times before he finally got this, and somebody who is doing his second term, somebody who should understand what the law is to finish voting and carry his ballot paper and show it to the camera, to the whole world. He's not even pretending and people say, oh, okay, maybe he was absent-minded. He carries it and shows to the whole world, CO, now APC, I vote for CO, I voted for APCO. That, that, that tape should go and be watched again. And people should look at it again. Now, immediately after that, you find an election, the result that is so bizarre that till tomorrow, I cannot explain what's going on. They say go to court. Right now, if we are to look at proceedings strictly from legal standpoint, you know that there will be problems. So we're asking ourselves, where are we going from here? And all of a sudden, from nowhere, somebody said, they say, oh, they want to do a coup, they want to do an interim government, so they want to... And who is saying this? The director of SSS, of all people in the world, who understands that you cannot do an interim government except through a certain process, even when you want to, as much as try not to imagine the other option, it has to be by the command of the man in charge. So really what is going on? And now at the twilight of their exit, they are now awarding jobs as if PDP took over from them or ADC took over from them. And they're like, let's get what we can while we can on our way out. Instead of a brother handing over to a brother, a seamless and to crown it all up, we don't even see the man that we vote, they voted for. Brother, the time has come for us to wake up and smell the coffee and ask ourselves, where are we going from here? And pray so that there will be peace in the land for the sake of you and I. Okay, um, I'm glad you've mentioned the fact that they are living and they're still making humongous uh, awards of contracts to people. And we don't, we don't know even whether they are going to follow that through because we've seen the ones that started seven years ago, eight years ago, still continuing and we're not seeing any headway to that. But let me go to uh, the other story, which also gives Nigerians concern. At some point in this country, uh, the borders were blocked. Importation of rice was stopped. A lot of other things didn't come into the country. And the presidency or the government of today uh, we're saying that they want to revamp the agricultural sector and they pride themselves as being one of the governments that has really, really changed the face of agriculture by funding and everything that needs to be done. Yet, we're seeing the story that the price of rice, which is a staple in Nigeria, has risen to 200%. And I begin to wonder, what actually did the government do? Or what did they, did they not do that will make people now buy rice at a price which is more than 200%? Let me, let me even tell you, see, we live in a very, um, I don't want to use the word interesting because really there's really nothing interesting about what's going on. We live in a very curious times and system and society. Let me remind you, number one, we are supposed to be self-sufficient in rice, number one. Number two, we are supposed to have banned importation of rice. Okay? When you put these two together, let me even not go further. Number three, it is commonsensical that production comes from, you know, the, the returns comes from the investment. It is when farmers have gone to the farm, they have farmed that at harvest time, they harvest and then the produce is made available. It is just commonsensical. But I want to ask you, 
where do you get the produce from when the farmers are in IDPs? Isn't it just too easy to extrapolate and know that there will be no harvest? When there is no harvest, there's not going to be product. When there is no product, the prices are going to rise. So if we are now getting 200% rise, I mean, is it rocket science for us to know where we came from and why it is where it is? And that while farmers, while men slept, while people in government forgot what the essence of government was, and they were running around on how to make money and they couldn't care less, insecurity was hitting us left, right and center, they've not been able to come and sit down and bring up policies that will stop insecurity, that will make for peace and return farmers to their farms and give them the necessary input so that at the output time, we will have these things available. Number three, all borders are supposed to be short and importation of rice is supposed to be illegal, but enter a new supermarket in Lagos or Uyo or Abuja or Kano or Katsina, Enter any supermarket. Please tell me how much of local rice you have and how much imported rice you have. And can somebody tell me how all the imported rice found their way into the into our market when it is supposed to be banned? Oh, what oh. is going on? It's kind of Let me help you. Let me help you. You know, um, Please, all, all, of su all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, that is coming right. All of a sudden, the the reports, you know, the statistics, you know, indicated that. Uh, small Benin Republic, small in terms of size and population, all of a sudden, overnight, became the largest importer of rice in Africa. You know, beating the likes of Ethiopia. You know, Nigeria is not importing rice anymore. So, mm. you know, <laughs> Ghana, even Liberia, Liberians eat a lot of rice. Um, so that I think I, I don't know if that answers your question. How did it answer? <laughs> so when you take the, the volume of import, extrapolate that against their own consumption requirement. Please tell me where the differential goes to. Well, thank you for helping. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what Fela called. Anyway, this is not what Fela talked about, but it's it's part of it. Fela said government magic, but maybe this one is is rice magic. Yeah. You know, this one is, is voodoo, <laughs> not just magic. You don't pass magic. You know, it's voodoo. The abracadabra. Yeah, I'm, I'm going is my brother from from um, Cross River State. Um, yeah. um, you know, we both both we do Cross River State inside out. Yeah. You can talk to people yeah. who are rice merchants who bring in rice through um, the former Akwabio, which is now Bakasi local mm -hmm. government. Yes, 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 yes. You know, yes. and and they've been telling stories of how they work hand in glove with some of these um, customs guys. In fact, yes. one told me that yeah. he, she knows a customs officer who is um, a major trader of imported rice to the north. Oh yes, oh <laughs> yes. Know? So, guy, let me tell you something. <laughs> this thing we call customs. One day. They will arise a pharaoh who knew not Joseph. One day, God will bring somebody who is ready to fix this country. All the car dealers, he doesn't, I don't know what DSS is doing. You can trace so many things to a very defined source. But we are keeping quiet and we are running this country as if it doesn't matter. One day, I don't know how it will happen, but God will raise somebody that will interrogate the system without the bad eggs and allow Nigeria to breathe. Question is, if God brings that Pharaoh, will we accept him? <laughs> because uh, obviously uh, Nigerians have their own definition of a Pharaoh that can, or a Moses even, that can take them to the promised land. So will we accept this Moses if he comes or if it is a let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you about, let me just take a, a second and tell you about Nigeria that people don't know. Nigeria, in my opinion, is a client nation for God, is a, is a nation where there is a hand of divinity that people um, don't quite reckon with. There was a time that we had a man called Abacha and we really didn't believe, I mean, somebody called me from U.S. and said Abacha was dead. I told him to drop the line and not call again because I couldn't believe it. I remember very well, very, very well, it was a landline. I never ever thought that Abacha, Abacha had taken so much hold of us that we didn't, he was like God. But you see, he just, he was just taken out one day like an anticlimax. Boom. And that was the end of the story. 
We thought that if anything happened to MK or Abiola, oh, this country will go to pieces, blah, blah, blah. Abiola just died, and boom, we moved on as if nothing happened. Coming to recent history, there was a time that they said Igbo should leave. 1st October, if they don't leave, 1st October, blah, blah, blah. 1st of October came and left. Nothing happened. Then there was a man called uh, Good Luck Jonathan that was going against the Buhari, and people were saying, oh, people, six months to election, people had left the country. Because they said, wow, this is a... And what happened on election day? The, uh, 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 President Jonathan just made one phone call, and it ended as if nothing happened. There was a man called uh, 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 OBJ. They said he was going to go for third term, and the thing was so much. One morning, I just watched on television, and they just took a decision, and what happened? Boom, third term just uh, fizzled into thin air. One day, Nigeria, look at the earthquakes, look at the natural disasters, look at all those things. We are spared from everything. Look at what some of the things that have happened in Nigeria, one hundredth of it would have caused major civil war and this country would have blown to pieces. But we are still there. There is a hand. I don't know how long we can take the risk of pushing that hand. But one day that hand is going to stand up and restore this country because Nigeria has a place in the global school scheme of things. And when that day reaches, God will do it and no man will do anything against it. All that right. day will come. All right. I, I hope you don't be. In, 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 no, my name is Ezekiel. I, I, Ezekiel. Yeah, the prophet Ezekiel. Yes. I hope they won't. Uh, you won't be accused of um, waging religious, um, <laughs> religious war. But let's not go. Let's not go there. But but um, um, we have to go. But the final one. Um, this one is uh, a sad one. I've been st struggling to look for stories too. Um, you know, some feel good stories, but I, I can't find. This one says excess crude account down to four hundred and seventy four thousand dollars, according to FAC. You know, four hundred seventy-four thousand dollars. Uh, the there's our own excess good account that they wrote to Jonathan to to share. You know, and then we have um, forty days ago, FEC approves hundred billion naira contracts. So I saw another report that says it's over one trillion naira. Mm, yeah. You know, one trillion naira. Over to you, sir. You see, there are, there are two things that just makes this. I have I had always prayed that President Buhari will exit on free, fair, credible elections that will make us to forget everything is done in the past. But I feel sorry for the family of the president because when he leaves office in about 40 days, what will come? Rhyme really because of the very silly, stupid, idiotic, nonsensical, unsensible election that they gave us called the presidential election. I think that that man will look back in very, very bad regret. Why am I saying this? If you look at the, the policies, all the indices of development, we are on the wrong end of it. That is number one. Number two, the level of borrowing is unprecedented. That's number two. Number three, excess account depleting. So the, the thing is so much money has been collected, we can't find where the money is going to. And even at the twilight, when they should be thinking in terms of restitution or really like stock taking, to find something that will just make them leave, exit in a, a near a semblance of bliss of glory. They are just breaking everything to the last minute. I hope they will stop and think because that excess crude account thing is just nauseating. And I pray that God will, maybe in these 40 days, 40 has always been a very significant number from the Bible times and everything. I hope that from today, something will hit the system positively they will wake up, the veil will be off their eyes, and they will say, look, let's just, for whatever is worth, start to do the right thing. 40 days is enough for them to rewrite their history by the grace of God. Okay, uh, well, we have to wrap it up at this moment. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok, for being a part of this show. It's always a pleasure having you, even though, like you said, you uh, just met uh, me for the uh, first time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, maybe tomorrow we'll find some more sharing stories on the front pages. I don't yeah, know. but let me just say this. Uh, I'm from Cross River, and where I come from is a very agrarian area, and I don't know why the federal government is doing what they're doing, uh, because rice should never be a problem here. Oh, no, in, come in, on. In, in uh, you're, you're going to fight. I'm also from Cross River yeah, State as well. It should never Have you not heard of Ayade rice? I <laughs>
Okay, so, I, I, I thought you were going to chuckle uh, well, <laughs> or choke. <laughs> no, no, no. What about IRD rice? There's like, rice in Cross River State. Yeah, what so, are we talking about? So I, I don't know why the, the government is doing this. They're putting in money to do what? When fertilizers cannot be bought. One of the stories that we read here is talking about fertilizers skyrocketing. When the chemicals that are used, the herbicides that are used, that used to be bought for like 2,000 naira, are being bought for 5,500 naira. How do you expect that rice to come down? So even the population that can still go into their farms cannot even buy the things that will help them plant the rice. There was, and that's if they can go to their farms in peace. <laughs> and we'll be right back. <laughs> but I know the federal government did something about giving fertilizer at discounted prices to farmers some time ago. That's just, just, just talking. That out That's there. just talking in a different realm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll talk Adamawa, Adamawa, Adamawa. Stay with us. <laughs> 